I'm here today to talk about a better approach to environmental education. And in order to do this, we really need to think about the traditional way that most people will get their environmental education. And let's start with a question. Which of these is the leading cause of the greenhouse gas effect? Well, actually, it's going to be water vapor. This is a naturally occurring phenomenon. Now, this is something that would be incorporated into a larger lesson, which would talk about global warming. But still, this is going to be how a lot of lessons are taught, just talking about global warming. And I want to ask you, if you get that lesson, how do you feel? Do you feel empowered? Do you feel like you can make a difference? Probably not. And I think that's the big problem when it comes to environmental education. It's depressing. And often, it involves what we have to give up. Maybe losing a convenience in order to make the environment better. So now let's look at something different. Which packaging is best for the environment? Now this is a question that anybody might face. If they go to a 7-Eleven, they're just trying to get a drink. For these, let's assume that they're all the exact same drink, the price is the same, the only thing that's different is the packaging. Which one will you get? Well, all of these can be recycled, but aluminum is the only one around the world that is routinely recycled at very high rates, and that's because it's the only one that can be recycled profitably. Now, this is a very simple little question that I've got here, but as an English teacher, I can take this into many directions, and I can use this for a beginner class, a middle-level class, an advanced class. But you know, not just English. You can use this with other subjects. And when you take the study of the environment, and then you also mix in other things, like society, business, technology, then we enter in something new called Education for Sustainable Development. Now, if I was giving this to a class, there might be several good positive learning outcomes that I would aim for. You know, take for example, maybe a student would learn that most of the time glass is not recycled. But a way that they could find out that really easy that it is recycled is, is there a deposit? If there's a deposit, so you have to return the bottle, they're going to refill it. And of course, that's more environmentally friendly. But I believe in Hong Kong, there's only one beverage, and that's a soy milk they sell at 7-Eleven. The only one. So that's one thing maybe the students will learn. Or maybe they'll develop a different behavior, like not buying as much bottled water. Or even better, what if their attitude changes? So they start talking to their family and friends about this. Or even better, what if we get them excited about a potential career in which they'd feel they would feel fulfilled and something that they could really make a difference with. So when we talk about education for sustainable development, you know, researchers have a challenge. How to measure it? So knowledge isn't so great because in this field it's so complex, involving many different parts, it's rapidly changing. For example, subsidies for electric cars, here today, gone tomorrow. Also, just because you know about something doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to make a difference with your behavior. I bet a lot of people in the world know of global warming, but unfortunately, it's getting worse and worse. And that brings us to behaviors. Now, in theory, it could work, but the problem about behaviors is that they're self-reporting, so you're probably going to get a little bias. You know, if I ask, who in here recycles? I bet everybody because you know that's the answer you're supposed to give. So the, the, the data will be biased there. Also, one behavior in two different places can mean two different things. Take, for example, that you take public transit in the US. That's a pretty good sign that you care about the environment. But what if you take public transit in Hong Kong? That's normal. That doesn't mean that you necessarily care about the environment. And this is why we usually will measure attitudes when we're trying to figure out how well some Education for Sustainable Development course is working, since they're very deep-seated and there's a very strong correlation with attitudes and behaviors. So when I was in Hong Kong University, I was lucky enough to work with this awesome team, and we had a project trying to measure environmental attitudes of secondary students here in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, we went to several secondary schools to measure the goal was to compare them with students abroad and also try to develop a way that we could do before and after to measure the efficacy of a program. So we chose the new ecological paradigm, which is the most used measure of uh, analyzing environmental attitudes in the world. Originally developed in the US, uh, also heavily used in Europe. 
The NAP scale is going to have 15 questions on a five-point Likert scale. Now, what that means is that you're going to answer anywhere between strongly disagree, strongly agree. After you answer the 15 questions, it's going to give you a score which will put you on a scale. On one end, you care deeply about the environment. And on the other end, you care deeply about societal growth, business. And the questions are going to be rotated as far as being positively and negatively worded. So if you strongly disagree with the odd questions, but strongly disagree with the even questions, you'd score five, which means that you're very ecologically minded. But conversely, if you strongly disagree with the odds, strongly agree with the evens, then that means you're really about humanity first. And if you score three, well, that means that you're neutral. So as I said, we gave this to many schools, and sadly, we found out it's probably not suitable for Hong Kong. Now, uh, we disagree about this inside our group, but when I'm looking at the data, I actually believe that it's because cultures disagree differently. And there's a lot of research that supports this. In North America, people as a whole are far more likely to be open saying, I strongly disagree with that. But in Asia, more often research shows that if you disagree, you might just put neutral. <laughs> yeah. So now you might be wondering, are there any alternatives? And again, this is when I get to disappoint you and say, not really. But uh, that brings us back to our original question, how to measure. But then start thinking a little bit more, do we have to measure? And what's education for? Is it for learning or for evaluation? And if we open up our minds that we can teach something that we don't have to grade and evaluate, then all of a sudden there's a whole new wealth of options that we can use as teachers. So as far as uh, teaching methods with curricula, uh, well, of course we've got standalone classes in Hong Kong. Um, you might have the IB class uh, program that would be offered. And uh, there is a class called Environmental Societies and Systems. And uh, well, this class does touch into sustainability, but of the 29 IB secondary schools in Hong Kong, only 14 even offer this as an elective. Now, there are a couple other courses that briefly discuss sustainability, but not very much. And then in the local curricula, uh, uh, the liberal studies course, they actually do have one module of six, which does cover sustainability. But in both of these situations, you're teaching sustainability to kids who are finishing up their secondary time. That means they're going to be about 17 or 18 years old. And most research shows that your attitudes, your environmental attitudes, are going to be pretty firmly in place at a younger age. If you try to do it as they are, it's too little, too late. And I think we can all agree, changing formal curricula is very challenging, very political, something I don't even want to mess with. A lot of schools choose to use extracurricular activities. Maybe you have a garden at your school. Maybe you take your kids to a recycling plant. And that works, but actually, I think there's a better way. And that's with a weaved-in hidden curriculum. A hidden curriculum is basically when a teacher is going to push his or her attitudes onto his or her students. I kind of think of it as putting your soul into a lesson. And this is how I do it. Actually, I simply just have a Facebook page where whenever I read anything, that's talking about sustainability, preferably in Hong Kong, but it could be something abroad that we might want to bring here, I just post it on my page. I use the page to share, but more importantly, to store, because I think any teacher who's taught for a while can remember a time that, oh, if I only knew where that one article was, I'd use it. This makes it very easy in order to have that information, those stories, sometimes videos, very handy. And then, as an English teacher, I would think about, what skills do I really want to work on today? It could be something generic, or it could be something more specific to English skills. Then I might present the question like this. Now this is similar to what we talked about before with global warming, but you notice how now it's a little bit more localized. How do people in Hong Kong contribute to global warming? I might ask this to my students, and they would probably say something like, well, we use energy, correct. And we use transportation, also correct. But actually, Hong Kong's ecological footprint is very high per person in the world. How can that be? So we might compare to other societies, like mainland China. What is it in mainland China 
that contributes to their footprint. And they might say something like factories and industry. Well, that's correct. Well, what about the US? Well, people there would have their own car and probably a big house, much more energy inefficient than we are here. That's all correct. So again, I'd probably ask them, well, why, guys? Why do you think that we have such this big footprint? And they're usually amazed to find that actually the biggest reason is meat. Yeah, people in Hong Kong are carnivores. You guys love it. And my students are amazed to find the amount of resources that go into it to producing meat. And this is where I believe I change a little bit from the traditional environmental education. I'm not trying to show stories of the Amazon being chopped down, but instead I'm trying to think of solutions. Talk about what we could actually do in Hong Kong. I don't want to make my students feel bad. I want them to come up with some positive solutions, using English of course, and try to figure out what they can. So I might start off with a simple question like, should we ban meat? And they say, of course not, that's crazy. But then I ask, okay, what about different stakeholders? What would be their stake? Why can we not do this? And we get some really interesting discussions. And then that's where I go back to that Facebook page that I told you about, and I find some stories that could be pertinent to this, like this one. This is a veggie burger that critics say tastes just as good as a beef burger. Or an urban farm here in Hong Kong. Or if we even want to take it one more level, an urban fish farm in Hong Kong. Those are true stories. And we'll talk about the pros and cons of each, try to get some more data. Uh, well, we might have a discussion, we might have a listening activity, a reading activity, many things we could do. And then in this situation, I might have a debate after that. What Hong Kong should do to reduce its ecological footprint? And I'll have my class broken up into different groups and we'll have an amazing debate. And since I've been doing this, you know what? I found that actually their English improves. Now, it's not just speaking. It could also be writing. It could be any of the skills. But something else happened. I've been teaching for 10 years now, and never once have I had a student come up to me and say, hey, Sean, I love this textbook. Doesn't happen. But I do have students regularly come up to me and say, hey, Sean, that lesson is really cool. It's different. I think I'll remember that, actually. And that's amazing. I, that's what I'm looking for. Now, there's other goals and other outcomes that I could hope for or things that could happen. Sometimes students will come up to me a little bit later and say, you know what? I eat a little less meat right now. I really make a conscious effort. I try to eat a little less meat. Some students will come up and say that they talk to their parents. You know, this is something that I find fantastic. But once again, unfortunately, we can't measure it. Now, we already said that curricula are so tightly packed, you know, there's not really so much wiggle room that we have in there, which is why I want to leave you with this. We need to look to a hidden curricula to help educate some of the things that can't be measured. And I truly think that if more teachers were to use education for sustainable development, they would find multiple advantages in multiple courses, but also they would see that it is a better way to teach about the environment. Thank you.